Shalom Chavrin, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And I trust today's message is going to be a blessing to you as much as it has blessed me. Uh, I want to take you directly to the book of Genesis. And, uh, and this may even answer, I know some of you guys have actually uh, got brave enough to look into some of these books that I've quoted to you that are considered uh, non-canon canon books, uh, the book uh, The Humane Gospel of Yeshua. And there was one thing that, that really stumbled a lot of people, and that's when Yeshua talks about the father-mother, the all-parent. Keep in mind, though, when he says all-parent, it's always in the singular, but it still stumbled some. Now, I wasn't really looking for this, but then the Lord revealed to me the most incredible revelation yesterday. And after he revealed it to me today, I was actually studying in the Bible only to find out Paul had the exact same revelation so I have to share this with you. Uh, this is over in the book of Genesis chapter 2, and we'll go to verse 23. It says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, when I first read this, the Lord began to deal with me. You know, because most of the time when we look at this passage, we're thinking of something in the future. We're not considering the fact that this is dealing with, a, with the present situation. It's dealing with Adam. And I began to realize, but wait a minute, where is Adam's father and mother, if that be the case? And so I thought about it. Well, you know, the Bible does say, let us make man in our own image. And everybody always wonders, who is the us in the beginning there? Well, God, when he made Adam, or humankind, is really what Adam means. Adam means humankind. He made them male and female. It says, He breathed into the nostrils the breath of life in a plural form, showing that there were more than one in the same body. But when he separates them, then the man comes to his, to his bride and cleaves to her, leaving what? His father and mother. Not the direct relationship of God, but he leaves a father and mother. And truly, God is our father and our mother. So how could we be stumbled with something like this? Well, then it got even greater. After I began to ponder that, then the Holy Spirit come in the room and revealed to me, the scripture is prophetic and speaks of Yeshua. It's not just Adam and Eve. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm thinking, Lord, what a revelation, because why? We are his bride. And what do we do? We leave our, what? Or he left his father, mother. In heaven, he left his earthly throne, his earthly position, and he comes to the earth. And some people might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jesus hadn't got a father and a mother. I mean, we know on earth there was Joseph and Mary, but you know, it really God's his father and Mary's his earthly mother, but we don't believe like the Catholic Church that he has a father and a mother. No, don't look at it that way there. See, God is both father and mother. That's why in the humane gospel, he refers to it as my all parent, all parent singular, because in God is both father and mother. You see, so he left his father and his mother. See, and he come down here to do what? To take his bride. Now, what's interesting, in the book of Matthew, Yeshua kind of brings that scripture out a little bit, but he doesn't reveal the secret behind it. He says here, Matthew 19, verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Therefore, wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You see, we are joined to Christ, and no man can put us away from Him. We are the ones joined to Him. He left His father and mother in heaven in order to come be with us. Now, some of you might argue, wait a minute, Brother Stephen, how are you going off on a lamb? God, you know, Jesus ain't got no father and mother. Well, you know what? Paul don't agree with you. I mean, you guys like to quote Paul a lot. I mean, many of you like to bring to me 1 Timothy in chapter 4 where he says, teaching in the end of the days of doctrine, seducing doctrine of devils and everything, and, and they're seared in their heart with a hot iron that teach to abstain from, from marriage and, and, and eating of meats. 
Well, you know, I want you to think about that just for a minute, minute before I go to this revelation. To abstain from meats. Well, by the way, the word meats there is not flesh, food. You know, I mean, and let me look at this because I wrote this down as well. The word right there, broma, is food. God does use a word for meat when he's speaking about physical flesh, and that's krihas. Uh, krihas is actually the flesh. And by the way, Paul does say in Romans chapter 14 that you're not supposed to eat flesh nor drink wine. So Paul certainly was not talking about this and where you're claiming there. Of course, you might go down to the next verse there, and it talks about, for every creature was given unto man and is good for food and nothing to be refused. Of course, I'm just paraphrasing that. You can look at it on your screen to see it. But in other words, the every creature. Well, the word creature there is not an animal. It's every created thing. See, really, if you want to translate it right, kitzma, for God has given every created thing. What was the created things that he gave us? In the Garden of Eden, he gave us the fruit of the trees. He gave us uh, uh, the vegetation and things like that that we were able to eat. That's what every created thing was given to us. And so really Paul is saying those that are teaching you to abstain from eating meat, maybe they put the little marriage part in there. And the reason why I challenge that is because why? Paul actually was celibate himself and says to his own followers, I would that you were like me, but every man has according to his gift. Well, in the humane gospel of Jesus, he says the exact same thing. He said it's not given for everyone to live a life like this, but there's some that it is. The rest, if they marry, just marry for pure love, not just for sexual gratification. So see, Paul taught what Yeshua says in the humane gospel. But over there, maybe somebody, you know, you have to remember, the, Paul's letters came like a fragment. Let me show you something here. Here's Paul's letter right here, all right? Let me just show you this. All right, you see how the page turned up and a whole lot of what Paul wrote there is missing? Have you ever thought that's the way the fragments of Paul's letters actually come? Do you know that the Catholic Church admits in their own encyclopedia that the, the church fathers, they just added in what was missing, what they thought he said? Maybe that's how these things got scrupled up because too many places look like Paul contradicts himself, but he doesn't. Okay, now, like I said, before I go to this wonderful revelation, I'm going to show you something real quick, though, in Romans there. Like I said, because, you know, one, I showed you, he didn't really say the word meat like you think of flesh, but that's the king's English. They even said in Genesis when God said that the fruits of the trees and all the vegetation, the vegetarian diet, the king's English and King James says that shall be meat for you. But in Hebrew, it says, ochel. Ochel is food for you. All right? Now, but in Hebrew, we have a word for meat, basa. Basa is the flesh meat. All right? Uh, there's another word in Hebrew for flesh meat as well, but it specifically applies to a cow. All right? Now, in, in Romans 14, what did, what did Paul say here? All right? He says in verse 21, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Wow. Wait a minute. I thought you just said that Paul said that eating meat is a doctrine of a devil. Well, I proved to you that the word meat that he used there is broma, and broma is food. But uh, uh, krihas is literally flesh, and here it is the word krihas used. It is the physical flesh, and he said it's good not to do it. Wow, didn't know that one, did you? All right, praise the Lord. I'm excited, though, because see, um, Ephesians. Now, let's go back to this revelation. As I said, what God revealed to me is that Yeshua left his mother and father and come to be and cleave to his bride, and you are his bride. And some of you might say, whoa, wait a minute, that's getting a little bit crazy. You're starting to sound like that Essene gospel where Yeshua talks about my mother and father, the, 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 uh, the all-parent. But remember, he says all-parent, singular. Never need to say parents. And like I said, God is both mother and father. He's everything to us. Is that not right? All right, now, but let's look at what it says here. Paul says here, he's dealing with the same subject. He goes like this, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Oh my God, Paul is talking about we're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, talking about Yeshua, right? And then watch what he does. Then he quotes Genesis. 
For we are members, excuse me, for, for, the, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Woo! Look at there. I mean, Paul recognized that the prophecy in Genesis applied to Yeshua, and he left his father and mother and come to cleave to be one with us. My gosh, you know what? Sometimes, look, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, you're, our Bible, you know, you have to remember, scribes and stuff got a hold of it. There's still a, there's a lot of truth in this word of God that we have. I don't, I'm not telling you throw the Bible out by no means. But you know, even, even Jesus, when Jesus came, remember what Jesus did? Remember how he says, it's written, of, said of them of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, see, he, then he tells you, don't do that. You know, he tells you, don't, do you know he's actually speaking against the Levitical law? He speaks against Levitical law when Jesus says that. He's actually telling you the opposite of what Levitical law is there. So do you want to keep the Levitical law? Or do you want to do with what it says when God says he give the commandments on Mount Horeb, the statutes and the judgment. And then we go and we read in Deuteronomy and there was 10 commandments and two statutes. And those two statutes were love thy neighbor as thyself and you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind and all your soul. And then the Bible said, and he added no more. Okay. So then you got to think about what, about what, you know, especially the prophets. There's so much truth in the prophets. Jeremiah 8.8 8 says that lying pen of the scribe has made it into a lie. So there are things that have been tampered with, but still we got a lot of truth. All you need to do to better understand our own Bible, get brave enough to read some of these books. Don't let it confuse you. Like I said, I am working and I, and I work on it every day doing a scholastic research on the humane gospel to prove that it really is. And it even matches our Bible prophecies directly from our own word, you know? And so I'm doing it so that you can see that. You know, I, I, I've studied Hebrew for thir over 30 years. I did Hebrew in, in college. I did Hebrew in Israel. You know, I know this language from a scholastic standpoint. And I'm putting this together so you'll better understand. And, and the more I do, the more I find the truth of it, that it's so accurate to the Word of God. Just we can't be afraid. The humaneness of it even. Even in the book of Proverbs. Do you know what? I wrote it down somewhere. Proverbs. Proverbs 23, 23, 20. Be ye not among wine bibbers or gluttonous meat eaters. It's, it's all there, you know? So, so don't be afraid. And let me just share with you a couple of things real quick here in closing. These are your early church fathers. Do you, do you know your early church fathers never quote from the gospel that we have today? Now, I, I say they don't because you can't get the quoting just right. Even when Paul, I found a place where Paul, when he, Paul talks about the communion service and he quotes literally what Yeshua says, you'll find it in the humane gospel of Yeshua. But you won't find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But his quotation in the book of Corinthians, when he quotes Yeshua and what he said is written in the humane gospel of Yeshua, okay? When Paul even says in, in, in his words there in 1 Corinthians about uh, he that destroys this temple, God will destroy. He takes it directly from the words of Yeshua, from the humane gospel of Yeshua. Yeshua says the same thing about us being the temple. His teachings are from there. So he's quoting from Jesus, but you just don't realize it because you don't see where it's at. And I'm finding many of Paul's quotations come directly from Yeshua out of the humane gospel. So if you read it, you'll see it yourself. But I'm doing it from a scholastic standpoint so you can see clearly where everything is at. And I'll, I'm putting that together to where I can send it to you in a PDF, those that are going to want it. Uh, and can actually see these references and how beautiful they line up. Uh, I wanted to share some things with you. Clement, he was one of the early church fathers. Did you know that he actually spoke and told us that Matthew was a vegetarian? Uh, and he says, uh, eating flesh and drinking wine is rather characteristic to a beast and fumes rising from them being dense and darken the soul. Imagine that. Destroy not the work of God for the sake of food, he says. Another thing he says here, he says, but those who bend around inflammatory tables nourishing their own diseases are ruled by a most licentious disease, which I shall venture to call the demon of the belly, the worst and most vile of demons. It is far better to be happy than to have a devil dwelling in us. 
For, for happiness is found only in the practice of virtue. According to the apostle Matthew, lived upon seeds, fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables, and without the use of flesh. Now, this is what Clement actually taught. Uh, even Tertullian, by the way, Tertullian, he states here in one of his um, that uh, uh, flesh eating is not conducive to the highest le life. It violates moral law and debases man in intellect and emotion. That was something Tertullian states there. And one of my favorite is Saint Basil. He actually stated, with simple living, well-being increases in the household of animals are in safety. There is no shedding of blood nor putting animals to death. The knife of the cook is needless, he states. But the table is spread only with the fruits that nature gives and with them they are content. Um, in the Talmud, of all places, the Talmud, written 200 years after the destruction of the, of, of the Second Temple, they had wrote in the Talmud, this is found in um, Baba Batra 60b, it says, when the temple was destroyed, the number of those who practiced abstinence in Israel increased. They neither ate meat nor drank wine. Yeshua must have been having a major impact on the people there. And by the way, Philo and Josephus speak about the Essene community. They likened it to the Pharisees and Sadducees, but they also say that they were the most holy, the most moral of all the Jewish communities in all of Israel. They really spoke highly of them. Josephus even says that Simon and John, the apostles of Yeshua, were Essenes. Something interesting. But I think the most powerful one of all, and this is what I want to close with, Pliny, who was an elder. He died in 79 uh, uh, A.D., after the death of Yeshua, he lived during the time of all the apostles. He was alive to know them, meet them, and understand things about what they taught. And one of the things that he speaks about is the Essene community, but he's the only one that tells us where one of the main schools of the Essene community was. And guess where he says it is? And this is what many scholars use in defending the fact that Qumran was an Essene community because he specifically states the Essenes was, uh, it was, um, actually says, next to the Dead Sea at the northwest side of the Dead Sea. Northwest side of the Dead Sea, friends, is Qumran. There was no other community in that area but the Essene community, who was from the Zadokite priesthood, which actually left a couple of hundred years, uh, left Israel because there was so much contention. He was against the animal sacrifices. And this is the community where Pliny said the Essenes lived at. And they did believe in the coming of the Messiah. This is where it's believed that John comes from as well. Now, I will say to you as well, there is a scholar that actually had a close relationship with another scholar that was part of the research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Remember, the Catholic Church for 50 years has hidden what was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They finally let Israel see some of the fragments, but never all of them. And one of the scholars that did get to see some of these scrolls that were never seen, he said, if they revealed what was really hidden in Qumran, it would totally unravel the Catholic Church. For many of the things that are taught today, are not what was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The writings of Yeshua were there. I think it's time we demand the truth. What about you? I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you. Stand with us in this ministry. We continually to see more and more people not want to be a part of this ministry nor support what is true. But I have refused to tickle ears. I love you too much to tickle your ears. If you want your ears tickled, there's churches all over the world that'll do that. The Pope will tickle your ears for you as well. I want you to know what's true. And so by God's grace, I will do all I can to tell you the truth. Some things I've pulled back on because I don't want to over flood you with information, but I do want to help you. And by the way, there's many other issues that you guys have written me about that you see that you're not sure of. Every one you've written me about is in your own Bible. You just don't realize it. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you. Shalom and have a great weekend.